Well, this is our final go this morning, and I've been so thrilled to be with you, and I love speaking to Chamber Fest. You all are so eager, bright, attentive, questioning. I really love that. So thank you for having me. I met my wife, Cindy, here at Chehi, and uh, we were... Well, we, she was a student, came in as a pianist, and um, then later we were both on the counseling staff and teaching, and we got married. And we have five kids, three of whom came here to Chehi for quite some time. And all that to say, I was on WhatsApp phone with her this morning, it's five hours later there, and she said to tell you she's praying for you, she's thinking of you, she really uh, relishes all her memories of her time at Chehi. And Chamber Fest didn't exist back then, but she's heard a lot about it from me and was with me here last year and got to experience it. Well, I purposely wanted to backtrack in our study of First Thessalonians so as to reinforce its importance by concluding our week, rather than dealing with the important biblical themes in chapter 5, which we have not given any attention to, but reinforcing the importance of a doctrine that I think is too much neglected in the Christian teaching today. So let's turn now back to chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This passage is really entirely focused on one of the most important doctrines, that is essential teachings that the church agrees to, in the New Testament that we too easily ignore or lose sight of, I think, and that is namely that Jesus Christ is coming again. We understandably give a lot of attention to the first coming of Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas time with a focus on the birth of Christ. But the New Testament urges that we not overlook this incredible Bible truth. There's quite a bit more across the spectrum of the New Testament dealing with Jesus coming again than there is with the birth narratives in the Gospels. And we come to that, of course, at the very end of this passage for this morning in chapter 3, verse 13, when it says, So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. <clears throat> It might interest you to know that this letter to the Thessalonians is more than likely the earliest writing of the New Testament. That's sometimes debated. Some scholars think it's Galatians. I'm personally convinced that 1 Thessalonians <coughs> is the earliest dated record of the New Testament. It precedes the Gospels. Our New Testament does not go chronologically in order in terms of when things were written. And with that in mind, this earliest letter, the Apostle Paul speaks of the second coming of Jesus Christ five times in this rather short letter. In chapter 2, verse 19, he refers to it. Here, of course, in chapter 3, verse 13, 
chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 2, and chapter 5, verse 23, showing us just how important it was in terms of earliest essential teaching doctrine. And the point of our passage here is that it is not just critical in terms of the future, but it is critical doctrine right now for Christian living, exemplary Christian living now in your current kind of existential reality of being a Christian in the world today. As we anticipate the return of our King. And with that anticipation in mind, I want to suggest to you, I don't have time to kind of unpack it, but I'll ask you just to trust me, the grammatical Greek structure of this passage all aims at verse 13b, giving concerted attention to the second coming of Christ so as to answer this hugely important theological question. So what? The other day I encouraged you to approach the Bible with always being honest and bold to say the question, why? Don't be afraid to question, why? Why that emphasis? Why that bit of truth? The other huge theological question is, so what? What difference does it make in how you live your life? That is to say, how should this a commitment to the truth, the doctrine that Jesus Christ is coming a second time, how should it impact your Christian life now? And it is surprising, maybe, that the Apostle Paul first stresses the place again, even as we saw back in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 that we examined a few days ago, stresses again what we call then incarnational ministry. This is what is meant in verse 11 when it is hopeful. By the way, in the original language of the New Testament Greek, uh, it's so precise you can even, there are also even things called the mood of the language. And here the mood is optative, which means it's full of hope, it's possibilities, it's hopeful. The very mood in this verse is the optative mood that God would direct our way to you. Don't skip over that, it's just incidental. May our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And the Apostle Paul feels so strongly about this that he actually changes the emphasis to focus it on God behind this, God doing this, as it literally would read in the original language, himself, our God and Father and our Lord Jesus, direct our way to you. God himself is behind Christians being bodily together. Paul is very concerned that God brings him and his team to them incarnationally, in body. The Bible here is simply making absolutely clear that being bodily present to be together, that is representing God in the flesh, not just in theory or thought or even by letter, is hugely important to the Apostle Paul, particularly in this context in view of this truth that Jesus is coming again. Why? Why such a 
emphasis on incarnational life direct our way to you? Well, perhaps because we all, all believers that is, are incarnational representatives of Christ. And our togetherness is meant to remind us of Christ in our midst and Christ coming. When I see you in the flesh, I am reminded of Jesus. We are the body. And I am also reminded that he is coming. Again, that reminds me to stress for you, young ladies and gentlemen of Chamberfest, I want to just urge you, this kind of leads into this emphasis on the local church, the local incarnational expression of your faith is hugely important. I've run into so many uh, followers of Christ just a little bit older than you who've kind of decided, well, I like Jesus, but I don't want the church. And that doesn't fit the New Testament. When you go off to university or college, I urge you, get involved in a local church where bodily being together, it's too easy. It's no rub when you're all on your own. Oh, I'm a Christian, but I have no contact in a local church. There's no rub of iron against iron. You need each other. That makes sense, and it's this idea direct our way to you. Second, look at me with what we read now in verse 12 that is really so astounding in the context of anticipating Jesus coming again. What does Paul emphasize? And may the Lord cause you to increase and overflow. You might think he would say in biblical knowledge or experience of the Holy Spirit. What does he say? To increase and overflow in love for one another and for all people. As we look ahead to Jesus coming back, what is demanded now? According to this text, likely the earliest writing in the New Testament, it is what I would call expanding love, isn't it? Not just love, but what does the Apostle Paul call for? Increasing love. And even more than that, overflowing love. It is the term peresuo in Greek, and it means something that spills out over the edge. When typically every day I put so much coffee in my cup, it spills out over the edge onto my shirt. And my wife says, no, you're not going to wear that today. <laughs> has spilled out over the edge. It's so full it cannot be contained. Love that is far from limited, but in fact is expansive love. I kind of had that sensation in a different vein last night as I listened to the lovely Rachel Koo and Graham Bergen working together I just thought that, that is like spilling over the edge talent. Just <laughs> thank you so much. I'm just like, didn't we all sense that? Just, oh my word. <laughs> to conclude with Paganini. Oh my gosh. This woman is so talented. You know, she's done Schumann, she's done Bach, Hindemith. And then a little Paganini. <laughs> and Graham, aren't you proud to have this guy as our director? 
He knows music. He's not just a director. He plays. He's incredibly accomplished. I thought, this is spilling over the edge talent. And I'm all for that. But also, sisters and brothers, spilling over the edge love. And I want to tell you, that's how I feel. I, I really love you guys. I love Chehi because of so many things. Amazing faculty, amazing counselors, amazing people that make things run. But it's mainly you, the students. This could not work without students. And I just feel this love for you. It's really true. That's why I like to come. And this is a degree of love that is not just some inner circle of family or friends that you pick out. Oh, I love them. Of course, we get along well. But what does it say? In fact, love for one another. There are people here and in your families and even in your home churches that you probably have to struggle a bit to love. <laughs> They're included for one another. But even that is not enough for such expansive love, Paul goes on to say, for all people. You see that in the text? For one another and for all people. That speaks to me about love that demands we move out of our comfort zone. It's easy to love the ones you choose. Love the one you're with. But when it asks you to move out of comfort to demonstrate love to somebody difficult to love or other cultures. So in my work with Muslim background refugees, all from the Mideast, there's lots of challenges, lots of fun, lots of blessings. We're baptizing 18 people when I get back. But I tell you, often it's very hard to love across two languages, Eng well, three, English, Farsi, the Persian language, and Arabic. That We have to do it in all of that. And sometimes there's lots of miscommunication. I thought they understood me, <laughs> and it was nothing settled in at all. And this is in view of the reality that Jesus is coming back. In view of the reality that Jesus is returning, what is of huge importance in the Bible? Growing, increasing, expanding, brimming up over the edge. Love for one another and for all, all, all people not just the ones you pick and choose. Why? Why would Paul emphasize this in view of the coming of Christ a second time? Perhaps because such focused attention on Jesus Christ, if it is genuine, both here and now, but also as we anticipate his coming again, should have the effect of both inspiring and generating, ultimately, the growth of love. And I tell you, that's one of the hallmarks for me of Chehi. Will Miss Chehi live this out and demonstrate it? I wish you all could know him. He took me under wing and something that is so reinforced at the Chehi Summer School of Music that has so dramatically impacted me was how Wilmus Chehi expressed not just musical excellence spilling over the edge with talent, but love. I had a habit that I actually learned from a chapel speaker at Chehi. I don't know, I was about 20 years old at the time that he said, always carry little cards and write down things that you remember or you want to be able to keep in your heart. So I have 
a card here from, it says summer 1987. Most of you weren't even born then, were you? And it says, Wilmus said this to me. He took me under wing, took me, often confided in me as I got older. He said, I want this, these students to know how much they are loved by me. Yes, of course, but mostly as I represent Jesus to them. And he would weep. We would walk around, especially as Chehi was coming to an end, and I would always stay after a few days and help clean up. And I would be alone with Wilmus Chehi, the founder. And he would just weep profusely because he would say, I just love these students so much. It really impacted me. And Dr. Shu, Sam Shu, he taught my wife piano, and she reported, I didn't hear this from him directly, but I wrote it down in 1988, how she said to me, Dr. Shu keeps telling me the secret to good piano playing is feel the love through your fingers. <laughs> Quite existential, metaphysical, I don't know if I don't think that's quite enough, to be honest, but it's a nice idea. <laughs> Feel the love through your fingers. Wilmus Chehi also wrote this down, or he said it and I wrote it down. He said, I want my, these students, I want them to be able to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, not just when they're children, but all through their lives. You know that beautiful story of one of the most famous theologians of all time? He was a Swiss, German-speaking theologian named Karl Barth. And he was asked by an elderly woman after one of his sermons in a church in Basel, Switzerland, if he had to narrow down the teaching of the Bible to one sentence, what would he say? The greatest mind written some of the most astounding theology of all time, and this is what he said. This is the essence of the Bible. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. To know that love. My mother used to say, Chehi is the land of love. I love that. As I got involved, I knew, learned there are problems at Chehi just like anywhere else. There's issues, challenges, but honestly, that's pretty true. I would come here, and I still do, and feel like I enter a cloud that envelops me, and it's a cloud of love. As you anticipate Jesus coming, grow in love for one another and for all. Not just the folks here that understand you, they share musical passion and you go home and who cares, you know. Find those people and love them. As you think Jesus is coming. Finally, the text here emphasizes one last thing that is highly important in view of the great truth that Jesus is coming a second time. We see it there in verse 13a, the beginning of verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. Now, I wish we had time to go into much needed detail here as it references being blameless and in holiness, both of which are so loaded with meaning and deserving of really serious explanation. But as I'm trying really hard to honor time constraints, because you've got to practice, can't wait to hear you perform tomorrow. I'm going to have to overlook that and just get to what is really the main idea <clears throat> And that is that God is clearly most concerned with our hearts. 
so that he may establish <coughs> your hearts. It is a heart stance, a heart attitude that the text says Jesus purposes to establish, meaning to strengthen or even better to make resolute your heart posture. The he here in the grammatical structure of the verse is actually, or the passage, does specifically refer to the Lord Jesus spoken of earlier. And it's referring to the Trinitarian role of Jesus the Son who gives such attention throughout his teaching to the heart posture. Jesus always saw through people's exterior. The Pharisees who kept the letter of the law, but what was in their heart. And so I love that just representing one of many texts from Jesus, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus, as you think of him coming, he is interested in what is in your heart. The Bible does not, you notice, reference your mind. Only as Jesus fills it, may the mind of Christ, my Savior, fill me, move me, be in me, direct me. Does not emphasize how much you know. It does not even emphasize your body, how beautiful you are, how strong, how feminine, or how masculine. It emphasizes rather your hearts. Perhaps as you look forward to the return of Jesus, it ought to affect your heart posture more than anything else, the place of your will, your emotions, your character, your personality. This matters most as you think of Christ coming again. Perhaps as we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ, it ought to affect more than anything else our heart stance, our heart attitude, the issues of our hearts. And as I conclude, I want to plead with you. Where are you in your heart toward Jesus Christ? God has allowed you to be here, to develop in so many ways. But at the heart of it is your heart, center of your will, the place where your emotions run, the, that which makes you uniquely you, your personality, your character. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's all aimed at that final doctrinally potent phrase with which chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians concludes. At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Incarnational ministry expanding, overflowing love for one another and for all and a posture of the heart because we firmly believe that Jesus Christ is coming a second time. The return of the King. Do you believe it? So what? Do you live it? Does it impact your life and mine now? And more than anything, I pray in this moment, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. Lord, I thank you for these students. I thank you for counselors. I thank you for all the faculty here. I thank you for the staff, all the kitchen people at Cairn that make all of this happen. And Holy Spirit, even now, there may be some here in this room whose heart is 
beating a little faster because they sense you speaking to them, draw them to first understand Jesus coming as a babe and living amongst us and showing us in the flesh God himself and teaching and miracles and going to the cross, atoning work for us, rising from the dead, victory over death and ascending, and now Lord over all creation, all the universe. This one who is returning as king, coming again. I pray that we would not just intellectually understand that or even believe it, but we would live it out. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Just bef as we conclude, I just want to offer, I, again, yesterday we had quite a serious look at uh, sexuality issues that the text raised. And if you would like to discuss that <coughs> with me uh, between now and Sunday night, I would be so happy to do that. The other thing, I experienced such love at Chehi. There was one year when I had had a circumstantial thing happen. Actually, just be honest with you, I was fired from a job. And it sent me, I was married, had two kids. That sent me into a deep depression. And I was debating whether I could come to Chehi. And Sam Shu knew about it, and he called me and said, Wes, just come to Chehi and do nothing. Let us love you. Let us heal you. <laughs> now, I did have a job to do, but we came, and he just spent every day, he would come to me and take a walk and pray, and he was so busy, and many piano students, he ministered to me love in my time of depression. I mean, I was seriously depressed, like I couldn't function. For about six months seeing doctors and psychiatrists and it in the end the Lord really healed and I learned a lot from that I share all of that because that too I am not surprised if some of you here right now really have struggles with levels of depression and if you want to talk about it I've been there and I would love to share you know what I learned along the way so bless you, work hard today. I'm going to be there cheering you on on Saturday at 2 o'clock. I can't wait to hear because I really love you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.